Welcome everybody. I'm going to give our participants just a few minutes to um, get on to the webinar. So please be patient for just a minute while we get everybody on and started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I'm really excited for this webinar in particular. This is the impact of ADHD and Tourette syndrome on siblings. I am Wendy Wegman, and I am the program lead for youth, young adult, and school education here at the Tourette Association of America. Our programs at the Tourette Association of America are sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Please, during this webinar, put any questions in the Q&A panel. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put them in the Q&A panel throughout the webinar, any questions that you have. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. This is Jane Indergaard. And Jane is an associate pro professor at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, and a licensed registered nurse in North Dakota and Minnesota. Dr. Indergaard is a longstanding provider of education, advocacy, and outreach for individuals living with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and provides consultation and multidisciplinary psychoeducational programming for providers and educators managing individuals with ADHD. She is a local co-founder of the award-winning Red River Valley CHAD, an affiliate of the National Organization Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. She's a recognized regional and national speaker on ADHD and part of a nationally touring expert panel presenting on the underdiagnosis of ADHD in women. Jane's interest in worldwide behavioral health collaboration has led to international presentations and the development of global health initiatives for advancing nursing practice, nursing education, and behavioral health care outreach for programs in Africa and China. She is currently co-leader for undergraduate interdisciplinary exploration of behavioral health service research and delivery in the United Kingdom. Her current research and clinical interests focus on the design, application, and implementation of psychoeducational programming and provider treatment for ADHD. And with that, I will turn the webinar over to Jane. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. And uh, we are just so thrilled to have been asked. Um, we know a lot about TAA and all the fabulous work you do. So it's quite an honor to be able to present here. And I am Jane Indergaard. I'm on the left of your picture there. I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. And on the right side, you'll see the wonderful, beautiful Jeremy Didier. Unfortunately, Jeremy, Jeremy cannot be here tonight. And she asked me to extend her regrets um, sadly, her mother passed away just last night, and um, she would like to thank Wendy for all of her support and, and understanding, and I'm going to try to do her part of the seminar, so bear with me. I might peek on my notes a little bit more than I typically do, but I just thought I would ask you all to just join me, and I will let her know we did this, and sending her our love and support um, and keeping her and her family in our hearts and prayers. So that's uh, me and Jeremy, Jeremy and I. And uh, we, I, we kind of, we look at this picture and I think we might kind of be the Midwestern Thelma and Louise of the ADHD advocacy people. So I just get a kick out of this picture. But I would like to tell you a little bit of the story of how we got started. So Jeremy and I met in 2014 at the International Conference for ADHD. And during that year, her chapter, ADHD KC, and my chapter of CHAD, Red River Valley CHAD, both won and shared the award for um, chapter of the year. And it was an incredible honor. And I met her and we, we clicked right away. And shortly after that, both she and I were involved with um, some uh, volunteer training for Chad and presenting some webinars on several topics. And then we were invited to um, an executive function training camp by the famous Chris Dendy. She's a, a, a terrific, wonderful mentor and author for ADHD. And we were actually bunk mates there. 
So, um, and we didn't know the other one had been invited. So we got there, we were bunk mates, thrilled. We figured out that's kind of serendipity, right? But through that process, we also were invited to be on a professional panel of women and their daughters. And we have been over the last three years um, touring different parts of the country to speak on the underdiagnosis and mis misdiagnosis of ADHD. And it truly was a remarkable experience and a great blessing. But so she and I did quite a bit of presenting together. So then the next piece of the story is, this is my daughter, Mary. Um, Mary is wedged between two brothers with ADHD. And Mary actually did get diagnosed late, hence the underdiagnosis of girls and women. Um, so she is the sibling. She's the impacted sibling um, that kind of was the impetus and the catalyst for this presentation. And actually, the, the reason it all got started was she came with me to a couple of conferences. And after one day of quite a bit of going to different um, events that day, she said, you know, mom, there's a lot of stuff for parents. There's a lot of stuff for teachers. There's quite a bit of stuff for providers. There's stuff for people who have ADHD, but nobody talks about the siblings and we live with them too. And so that actually started us both talking about maybe putting something together and trying to do a presentation. So we got together, we outlined a draft. Um, I started working on it. She was going to present with me and then um, we were accepted a, a conference with another organization and she couldn't make it. So I wasn't quite done with the draft and I called up Jeremy because I know how great she is at last minute stuff. And she and I fit, completed it and then we presented it. And so that's the sibling part of, the, of this talk. And then I also wanna introduce Jeremy's daughter, Sophie, who was also part of that panel. And my understanding is that Sophie actually presented with her mom about a year ago, if I'm not mistaken, for TAA because Sophie also has comorbid Tourette's. My daughter has pandas, but she doesn't have uh, the diagnosis of her Tourette's. But so both of our daughters um, have quite a bit of experience with neurodiversity. And um, I think Wendy reached out to both of us and asked if we could combine the, con the conversation and present for you. So serendipity, here we are, here I am anyway. So here I am and I miss Jeremy and I wish her well. So the purpose of the presentation is threefold. We wanna increase educational awareness about the impact of comorbid ADHD and Tourette's, not only on the entire family, because that's important, but especially on the siblings of the affected individuals. We're hoping to promote positive outcomes for the development of family relationships, but especially the well-being of that of unaffected sibling. And by unaffected, I mean the child that doesn't have the ADHD and Tourette's. And to do that, we want you to leave with not just knowledge, <clears throat> but a toolbox of skills as well. So I'm hoping that from this um, presentation, you will actually have some ideas and suggestions for things that you can do to help improve the life of the siblings in your household. And of course, we always put up this disclaimer. Um, we do have evidence-based information we're providing, but please don't change any of your treatment for any disorder unless you consult your care provider. So the conversation really starts with neurodiversity. We all know that daily life is very different and much more challenging than for families of neurotypical individuals. We know that, we live it every day. When I started to take a deep dive into the literature, I was struck by something that I don't think existed maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago. And I saw a lot of authors when they were talking about neurodiversity and the impact of neurodiversity in a household, not specifically on siblings, but in a household, they mentioned that daily life challenges and strains on relationships in a house, and in this case, ADHD and Tourette's, mirrors the experience of parents and siblings of children with other chronic pediatric disorders like diabetes mellitus, um, epilepsy, um, cystic fibrosis. So the reason that struck me was for once, people were recognizing that a behavioral health diagnosis is as significant and especially chronic and important and has much, as much of an impact as a physical diagnosis. And that hasn't always been the case. So I'm very, very pleased about that. But I would add, I do think neurodiversity and diagnoses, behavioral health diagnoses, have a few unique features that maybe don't exist with physical diagnoses. So for example, in the case of the two we're talking about tonight, ADHD is a hidden diagnosis. You can't tell somebody's ADHD, you can tell by the behaviors, but not just by looking at them. We know that Tourette's is highly misunderstood. 
we know that both disorders have behaviors as their symptoms. And unfortunately, for a long time, our society pretty much attributed behaviors to character, personality, parenting, and it didn't occur to them that, that in these diagnoses, the symptom of the underlying condition, which is real, is behavioral. So fortunately, again, I think that's getting better. We also know that parenting a neurodiverse child impacts everything. So it impacts pretty much every aspect of the household. And Jeremy and I both found quite a bit of literature that highlighted that and addressed that. And we'll actually be working a little bit more on perhaps getting a presentation together about that because it is prevalent, the, the literature is out there. And we just put a smattering of some of the findings, not, not to go through all of them, but just to give you an example of how significant an impact having a neurodiverse child in your household can be. So for example, in the ADHD literature, we did learn that, <clears throat> I won't read through all of these, but that um, parents with children with ADHD do have a tendency to develop negative coping skills. There is a prevalence for increased chronic health issues, as well as increased substance abuse and other addictive behaviors because of the stressors of that household. Um, we also know that oftentimes one of the partners in a relationship will leave the workforce because the demands of that child in the household require a degree of flexibility and attention that can't be done if they're also doing the job. It's a very prevalent thing. In the Tourette's literature, we read quite a bit about how the parents of kids with Tourette's have lower self-concept. They also have a higher caregiver burden and difficulty with home activities, particularly with moderate to severe Tourette's. So the whole point, once again, is we know that neurodiversity impacts the household, and there's a lot of great literature out there about how it impacts the parents in a household. And before I dive into the, uh, the focus on siblings, just want to be sure we're all coming from the same definition of the disorders. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a neurodevelopmental condition, and it's marked by a persistent pattern of impaired self-regulation in regulating your activity level, regulating your attention, regulating um, your, your, your um, impulses or responding to impulses. It also has the feature of impaired executive function, which are mental skills or mental processes that help us achieve goals by helping us organize, plan, have time management. So they're located in our frontal lobe and they're very significant and they are impaired and can be impaired to varying degrees in ADHD. And I often, when I'm presenting, will get asked the question, well, doesn't everybody have lapses of memory or lose their focus or maybe feel a little bit restless? And the answer is yes, of course people do. But ADHD isn't just periodic uh, evidence or expression of these issues. ADHD causes clinically significant impairment in function and development in your lifestyle day to day and every day. And so um, it is significant, it is real. It's the most frequently recognized outpatient pediatric psychiatric disorder, and it does persist into and across adulthood. And then Tourette's syndrome is also a neurodevelopmental condition, and it's marked by the presence of multiple motor tics and one or more phonic tics for at least a year. And I do understand there, you know, I, I teach this in my mental health nursing course that I teach. Um, I understand, you know, there's a whole series of tic disorders, and we're only going to focus on Tourette's syndrome tonight. We know that the onset can be as early as two years, but more commonly around six to seven years old. Boys are diagnosed more often than girls, and it can be lifelong, but it does commonly diminish in adolescence or late adulthood, although there are definitely people in late adulthood that have significant Tourette's. And then taking a look at its incidence and prevalence. So, if this gray circle represents all the children in the United States between the ages of two to 17 years old, the blue segment of pi actually represents children with ADHD. So about 10% of our population in this age group have ADHD. The orange section represents Tourette's syndrome. Now that might be wider if we add other tick disorders, but that's roughly 0.6% of this entire population. And I was, I was trying to translate that into numbers. And what I found was different, a couple different ones, but about one in every 162 children or one in every 133 children. And so Wendy, feel free to correct me if those statistics aren't what your organization um, promotes. But you know, if one in 10 children have ADHD and one in 300 to, to uh, one in 130 to 160, 
You can tell the prevalence is different, but not less significant by any means. And I think what's really interesting about ADHD, and I laud you, Wendy, um, for reaching out and having us talk about it in terms of coexisting conditions, because if you're not aware, you may be, but if you're not aware, ADHD and Tourette's syndrome are highly comorbid, or they exist quite often together. My understanding of Tourette's is there's a lot of comorbidity or conditions such as learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, um, ODD, but the, by far the condition that is the most commonly comorbid with Tourette's is ADHD. So I also went into literature to look at the relationship. How many people with ADHD have Tourette's and how many people with Tourette's have ADHD? And if you look at my little very, very primitive graph here, if these are segments of about 20%, so 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and if this represents all of the children we talked about, that 0.6% of all the children in our population who have Tourette's syndrome, we also know that roughly 60 to 80%, some people went as low as 52, but most of the literature said 60 to 80% of our kids with Tourette's syndrome also have ADHD. If we look at the ADHD population, which is 10% of that population, um, we look at how many of those people with ADHD have Tourette's syndrome, it's roughly 23%. And again, I think that might expand if we add some of the other tick disorders. So while ADHD is more highly comorbid with Tourette's, people with ADHD do have Tourette's. So it's a highly comorbid um, condition, and I think it's pretty significant to be looking into. And these next two tables are just illustrating a point that I'll make on three slides from now. So um, Jeremy actually put these next two tables together, and she looked at just a variety, a smattering, a sampling of different types of problems that occur in households, not looking at any particular condition. So, you know, are there problems with family and peer relationships? Are there problems with bullying? Is there, are there problems participating in recreational activities? We looked at jobs and finances and academic performance. And as you can see, if you just have Tourette's alone, there are significant implications and problems and issues with these life conditions. I was surprised that um, ac overall academic progression was for performance was actually fairly low as a problem, but I suspect that's if you only have Tourette's and not all of the other associated um, learning disabilities that can occur. In ADHD, same thing, you know, a little bit higher problematic, we'll talk about why in a moment, a little bit higher in problems, but certainly express problems across those domains. Okay, so ADHD causes problems, Tourette's alone causes problems, but look what happens when we combine the two. So in this third column, significantly higher percentages of problems when ADHD and Tourette's are combined. And so we asked the question, what is going on at home? And again, we looked through the literature and this is again, just to illustrate that same point, we looked at if you have Tourette's alone, you're worrying about ticks. It can be associated with executive function deficits. There can be emotional regulation issues. ADHD, these kids are, can be impulsive depending on the type that they have. They have challenge executive function. They are distractible. They have emotional regulation issues. But once again, when you combine them, it magnifies those problems considerably. So it is really important and for thinking, Wendy, to um, be looking at this, this as, as a combined condition. So the answer to the question, what happens when you have both ADHD and Tourette's, is that the challenge of, challenges are amplified and magnified. A lot going on in the house. Another interesting finding when we looked at the literature was when we looked at, especially combination ADHD and Tourette's, it was actually the ADHD, you saw the difference in percentages, that creates the worst parenting stress. Um, and that's because ADHD is more of a catalyst for negative social interaction than Tourette's alone. So that's pretty important. It's the ADHD that causes the worst parenting stress. In terms of research, when you look through all of the research about the impact of these disorders, and especially when they're combined, it largely focuses on the parental experience. So what do parents experience when they have a child? And that's important, right? All of us probably, when our children got that diagnosis, tried to find all of the best information we could. We also know that the impacts of ADHD and Tourette's, especially in combination, are widely reported from the perspectives of affected individuals, 
parents and caregivers and educators. Just what my daughter said, went to this conference. This was all they, these are the only people they talked about. And we are missing a very important part of that population. And that is the siblings of these children with that neurodiversity. And we definitely found that it's a very under-researched area. We really haven't learned a lot about the impact of those conditions on the sibling in the household. And that's a very, very important thing that we should be studying. And that's because siblings matter. The sibling relationship is one of the longest relationships in most people's lifespan. And it's a very intensive relationship, tends to be. And sibling relationships can serve as an important context for learning and development for both the affected child and the unaffected child. So when we started looking at the actual literature to see what, what is out there, and again, um, we looked at ADHD and Tourette's separately and in combination. What I will say, I want to kind of correct myself, there's nothing out there unless you're looking at autism spectrum disorder. And we were surprised, not surprised, but pleased to find out there was a little bit more focus and attention on ASD than any other uh, neurodiversity. However, it generally focused on the impact of the non-affected child in the school setting. So once again, what's going on in the household for these kids with ADHD? So we, we based our study looking at, not research study, but our investigation or dive into the literature on these three things that we know that Tourette's and ADHD, the experience of that will mirror that of any family with a chronic physical or behavioral condition. We know that. We are assuming that siblings of affected individuals have very unique support needs, which is true of anyone who's living with someone with neurodiversity. And we were really concerned at looking at how we're gonna diagnose well being or what the impact is on well being. And we both believe, based on our backgrounds and the work that we do, that well being is contextual. And it really is the lived experience, not just the list of symptoms, not just the, this is, these are the kinds of areas that can impact, but what is the lived experience? So we focused very much on getting information gathered together for you to show you what the lived experience is of these kids um, with, with combined ADHD and living with people with combined ADHD and Tourette's. So I might, might surprise you for a second. I am gonna start just one brief thing on impact for parents, even though this, this system is, um, or this topic is actually going to be about siblings. I'm sorry, I just got a note on audio. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, um, pop-ups, don't you love them? So we know that there's a very significant impact of ADHD and Tourette's syndrome, both alone and combined on parents and caregivers. And without going into all of the different facets, we know that if you are parenting a child with ADHD and Tourette's, you're stressed. And the more symptomatic your child is, the more stressed you are. And we looked at things or found information where it had significant repercussions on a lot of issues related to parental well being, on parent self fulfillment, on psychological well being. We learned that parents um, not only had self esteem and self concept issues, but they also developed um, more, more uh, discipline styles where they overreacted to behavior where they, were, they had more stress responses than healthy problem-solving responses. They tended to exhibit harsher discipline coupled with lower warmth. What happens here? It's all about the relationship with the child, right? That really strains a relationship, but that isn't just with the child who's affected with a neurodiversity. That exhibiting harsher discipline and lower warmth also extends to the sibling of those children. So let's go back, let's go into the impact on the siblings. And there can be a very profound effect on the siblings in a household. And I think we are just starting to learn more about that. And in the literature that Jeremy and I reviewed, there was a huge one-term theme. And that was that these kids live with disruption. Day-to-day, week-to-week, year-to-year disruption. It was prevalent throughout all of the literature. And that disruption gets expressed by a reduced overall quality of life. And what these kids report is they, they live with daily high levels of conflict. They have daily emotional arousal in themselves and their siblings and their parents. The behaviors of their siblings are very annoying and disruptive. It's frustrating because the parents are stressed and preoccupied. And this is a very sensitive area that we'll get into. They very much perceive and experience differential parenting, treatment, and discipline. 
And so they do describe their life as chaotic and conflictual and exhausting, and they yearn for peace and quiet. Hmm, that's a lot in a household. Another critical theme was their relationship. And this to me was um, really touched my heart in a number of different ways. Kids of siblings with ADHD and Tourette's described impairment in the relationship with their parents, with the siblings, and with extended family because of those negative social interactions that occur from the behaviors. I was especially, I mean, I think obviously the relationship, the impairment of the relationship with parents and siblings is really a concern because you're living with those people, right? You want to have warmth and kind of cohesion and connection. But if you also add into that mixed extended family, wherever do they go for any kind of sanctuary or reprieve or understanding? Secondly, um, in the work that I do with our Chad group, we do get a lot of people that will bring a grandparent or I've had a lot of grandparents come by themselves. And I'm just warmed by that because really we do need to include our extended family. We need to reach out to them and get them educated so that they can be on board too. So sad that not only are they in a chaotic ho household, but they discuss and describe impairments in the relationships with the significant people in their lives. This next series of slides is what I call postcards from the edge. So in this slide, we reviewed the literature and we looked at, it was a lot of anecdotal case study or um, qualitative research where they actually had quotes and expressions of that lived experience. And then we also basically did an informal study on our own family. So both Jeremy and I asked all of our children what their experience was like in our household growing up. And I wanna start by mentioning, Jeremy and I are in very different places in our family life. So my children are all grown and out of the home. So when I questioned them, keep in mind, they were retrospectively looking at that. Jeremy has some kids launched, some at home and a very young child. And so she's going across the gamut. And when we got started, she actually called me one night and said, I'm really kind of having a hard time with some of the things my kids are telling me. And um, I imagine most of us do. And I remember being at a point in time where I wondered if my kids were ever gonna get along if they were only gonna remember that I was an angry, frustrated parent. And so the reason I'm saying that right up front is, I don't want you to get discouraged when you see some of the things that your kids are reporting and there's a positive message at the end. So the first thing that is reported is that the parent is preoccupied. And when that parent's preoccupied with all of the needs of that um, neurodiverse sibling, the kids that don't have the neurodiversity or the sibling of that person feels victimized. And it's not just from the parent preoccupation, but from the sibling themselves. So there is a report of a lot of physical aggression, emotional, verbal aggression, um, and manipulation. But what was interesting, all of the research was very careful to say it was reciprocal. So it wasn't just the neurodiverse um, sibling victimizing the non-affected child, but the non-affected child fought back. So again, that, that constant conflict and emotional arousal in the house, but they felt victimized. They also felt resentment on all the time, attention, and emotional energy that that child was taking away, taking from the parents. There was embarrassment of the behaviors, um, especially when they're out in public or in school or at a family event. They experienced jealousy of the time and the attention. And, you know, when you're, you're taking care of these kids, we have lots of doctor appointments. Um, we're looking at school accommodations, all these meetings. And we know that we're doing it as work and support for our child but they see it also as you're spending more time with them and focusing on their needs. Another really interesting piece was there are definitely elements of grief um, in these kids and they feel um, a sense of sorrow and loss. And when I asked my own kids about it, they said it was kind of, you feel like we don't have a normal house. We aren't, we're, we're missing a normal family life. We're missing a normal childhood. So there's, an ex there's the experience of grief and loss over what they're missing because of the distraction and the disruption of their sibling. So I'm going to remove this picture and share with you. These are the postcards from the edge. So these are just some quotes to illustrate that point of, being, of the parent being preoccupied. He always got more attention because he wanted more attention. My needs would always be ignored. The second uh, theme that kind of came about from our investigation was that very much they felt that, the li that life in their household depended on the sibling. And by that they meant activities, choices for what the family was gonna do, how long they could stay at things, if they went on vacation, 
if they could get a babysitter, depended on the sibling and their level of emotional arousal, their degree of functioning on any given day. And so because life depended on the sibling, they, and oftentimes that meant that their life got very constricted, they feel isolated, they feel left out. And unappreciation was another theme that came up. And I'm sure Jeremy won't mind if I share her story. She did the last time we did this. And her story was that um, her daughter had approached her when she was talking about uh, what her daughter's perceptions were. And she mentioned, you know, when their youngest child, who I think, I believe has autism and ADHD, when he pushes his chair in at the table and puts his dish up at the sink, you give him stickers and rewards and verbal praise. But I have cleaned my room, done my own laundry, went and got you groceries, and not a thing was said. And what Jeremy mentions is her first thought, she said, thank goodness it didn't come out her mouth. But her first thought was, why should you get rewarded for doing what you're supposed to do? Wow, right? Um, gives me goosebumps every time I hear her story. Why wouldn't you feel underappreciated? So she said, you know, really made her more intentional of understanding her daughter really is trying to help and trying to be supportive and doing what she can and will do. These kids feel overshadowed by the behaviors of their sibling and the attention to those behaviors. And I bolded this last thing, they feel rejected, um, not only from um, the isolation and from the parental attention not being directed at them and from being unappreciated, but they feel very sensitive about being rejected. And Right now, there's a lot of literature coming out on rejection, um, sensitive dysphoria. And most of that literature, again, is focused on the kids that have the disorder. And it's very important, it's a critical thing, but I think we need to start looking at it on siblings. And I know my daughter has expressed that she had read about it and feels like she does have that. And it's made her have quite a bit of social anxiety as a result. So I think we have to be really, really attentive to the fact that the world of these kids does function on the life depends on the sibling. Here's their quotes, postcards from the edge. Everything revolved around my brother and it almost was like it had to go his way. I got cheated out of things because if we were out and my sister got tired or bored, we would have to go home. And I can think of many, many situations in my household where that happened as the kids were growing up. And I also will say it, when those did happen, I did, I did remember thinking, are they going to hate me later on because we couldn't take that vacation? Another interesting piece, I've just talked about a lot of anger, antipathy, frustration, really hard negative emotions. But now we're going to shift to another series of negative emotions, compassion, worry, anxiety, and guilt. And they gave many comments about having both these hard, angry emotions and at the same time, like this, feeling guilt and worry and anxiety. Compassion isn't a bad thing, but that the compassion for their sibling drove that worry and guilt. And they expressed a sense of powerlessness and hopelessness to do anything about it. There is in the literature, our kids didn't express this, but there is in the literature some concerns about our kids expressing that they feel parentified. So I actually read a couple case studies where um, a sibling of a child that had a neurodiversity had to be the one responsible to make sure that child took their medications. Um, the mother was just too exhausted and didn't wanna do it anymore. Um, also maybe helping them, ma making them do their homework and making sure their homework was done or had to be the babysitter. And certainly there's room in every family for collaboration and taking care of each other and so on. But there's a difference between that and parentifying a child when they're loaded with responsibilities at a time when they should just be experiencing their childhood. So that, that was an alarm for me. I was, I was surprised to see it, but um, I understand how and why it's there. But this is imposed on them, right? This is when someone is expecting them to have those behaviors. They can do a self-imposition of similar behaviors in the need to be perfect. And so, for example, my daughter had a lot of almost OCD type symptoms and I'll, I'll share the postcard from the edge. My parents had a lot of stress dealing with my brother. So I felt I had to be perfect and not give them any trouble. Another one, I felt sad. This is the compassion, the worry. I felt sad when her teammates would diss her and she would miss things because of all her detention. So they notice the things that their sibling is missing and they, they hurt for them. 
So what you're seeing is we talked about the environment of the home, but we're also talking about the feelings that these kids have their own internal psyche. They feel strong, negative and conflicting emotions about their sibling struggles. On the one hand, angry, frustrated, feel neglected. On the other hand, feel bad for them, feel worried for them. So there's a lot going on for these kids. I put this slide in here um, again, because Jeremy and I are at different places and this illustrates something that I experienced when I talked to my kids. And this is a um, qualitative study. It was a graduate student. Um, she only interviewed three people. So it's qualitative and it was just um, a kind of a, a structured interview type of study, but she wanted to find out three siblings, three siblings of kids with ADHD who are at college age and how they felt about their childhood. And in those three, what she found was similar to what I experienced. So that overall positive experiences were presented by the siblings. That's a surprise, right? Again, thinking back to what was going on in the household, I, my whole years of raising my kids, it was like, oh my gosh, are they ever gonna wanna come home again? Are, they, do, are we gonna have a relationship? But these kids reported overall positive experiences presented despite the fact that they acknowledge their sibling was difficult to live with. It's really interesting. And they discussed, they felt an innate, innate sense to protect. They felt a kinship and an innate sense to protect. They denied feeling forced to parentify. And when asked why they think they had come to that place, they said along the way, especially with support and education, they found a way to deal with and accommodate their sibling. I think that's a hopeful message. Um, and I actually definitely shared that with Jeremy. And that is pretty much what my kids said. Although when we started reflecting on specific individual things, you could see the emotions coming up again. Yeah, that time he got to go to this and I didn't, and, you know, that kind of stuff comes up. But I was impressed by what happens over a teacher of time. There's some more good news. In the Tourette syndrome literature, and this wasn't the comorbid Tourette, but this was just Tourette's alone. There were several studies, and I'm sorry, I, sh I forgot to post them on this slide. So if anyone's interested, um, please email me and I'll send you the studies. But they reported that the siblings of kids with Tourette syndrome develop interpersonal skills from the sibling relationship. And they build novel skills, awareness, and empathy from the relationship. And that's not a small thing. So there is some good news, but how do we get there? How do we overcome all of the obstacles? Well, a hopeful message to take away is that the relationships and the dynamics improve on um, two things. As support increases for the child, the non-neurodiverse child, as support increases for them, and as the clarity of the diagnosis is provided. And we're going to talk a little bit about education and communication. Really, really important. So what did all of that um, deep dive into our kids and the literature tell us? The sibling relationship is probably an underutilized protective factor in the child with ADHD and Tourette's. Clinicians must adequately support the family after a diagnosis. And I added this because as a nurse who's worked um, in a, a number of different clinical settings, one of the things um, that's sort of my um, flag I wanna raise is when we have a kid, for example, that gets diabetes, they get the diagnosis and we actually have certified nurse educators who are diabetes educators. And they will spend time with the family, educating them, um, getting them up to speed on the issues with, with their um, child. I've also heard that there are people who do that for asthma and epilepsy. We do not have a counterpart in the clinical practice for behavioral health diagnoses, and in this case for ADHD and Tourette's, where they get that psychoeducation along with the diagnosis. And I live for the day when we see that. Fortunately, there's places like TAA and CHAD where people can go to get it, but wouldn't it be nice if it was included in your, in your, where you're getting your treatment, where you're getting your diagnosis, where you're getting your therapy. So again, that question, how can we as parents and caregivers get to that place with our kids? How do we challenge and support the sibling relationship? How do we impact the framing of their disability or their neurodiversity? So Jeremy and I came up with a list of, we kind of call these the goals. And then after this, we'll go into the actual skills. But so, and I'm gonna read this so that I don't miss my notes on this slide. So the first thing we have to do is to creatively find ways that the siblings with different abilities 
can access and support each other while navigating challenging situations like navigating school together, navigating the medical community, navigating peer and sociological relationships. And we do that by supporting each sibling individually, recognizing those strengths, strength-based focus, right? And nurturing that sibling relationship every way we can. And we'll look at the skill set for how to do that in just a moment. But so we need supporting and nurturing in order to allow those kids to start developing an appreciation for each other's skills and abilities and maybe even sharing them together. The next thing that we recommend is that you need to keep the focus on surviving as a nuclear family. Really important that your nuclear family is your priority and your first focus is with that nuclear family because that does build cohesion and adaptability among those kids. Next, you want to seek and build social support. And we are gonna recommend you reach out not only to peers and family members, but providers. Get providers who work with you. Get providers who understand you and your child. They're very good, excellent providers out there, but, and even providers will say, you don't always click. So make sure you find somebody that clicks. You need to surround yourself with a support network. Also remember that the family life cycles and changes over time. There are ebbs and flows. And so adjust your expectations. You will get to places where things are going well for a while and then have a setback. Hey, but you got there. So the next time, maybe you'll get a little bit further ahead and then the setback. So just remember that, remember your expectations, even in families without neurodiversity, the family life cycles and changes over time. So I'm not gonna leave you with the goals. We are also gonna tell you, how do you get there? What do you do? So we, we developed a skills list and we split it into um, these categories. We're gonna talk about education and awareness, communication, consistent rules, but we're gonna put our emphasis on the talk about fairness, the big red flag trigger thing. We're gonna talk about modeling. We're gonna talk about tincture of time and we're gonna talk about building your support team. So we'll start first and foremost with education. And if you're attending this, you're already doing this. So I'm preaching to the choir, but the first and foremost thing is to get informed and then educate the entire family, including extended family in age appropriate ways about ADHD and Tourette's. Part of that education needs to include arming, especially the siblings, with the ability to answer questions to help inform others. So you may wanna develop some scripts. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was asked to go down and review a school system uh, down in Fort Myers. Um, this was quite a while ago. And it was because that school had invested in getting teachers master's degrees, what at that time was called varying exceptionalities. And they came back to the school, trained the rest of the staff, and then had a huge three-year campaign to destigmatize behavioral health diagnoses in their school. And I was brought into a classroom. I was introduced to the class. And then the teacher had Timmy and Will sitting next to each other. And she turned to Timmy and she said, Timmy, why is Will sitting in the front row? And Timmy said, because he has ADHD. And she said, okay, Timmy, yes, that's right. But why does he have to sit in the front row if he has ADHD? And Timmy, who had glasses said, well, I have to wear glasses to see the board. And Will has to sit in front to pay attention in class. It was as simple as that. It wasn't a stigma. And those kids, I sat in some of their circle times and um, watched them on the playground. They really had a deep understanding and destigmatization of these neurodiversities. So if we can help our kids get language like that to explain the behaviors of their sibling when friends notice it, um, to be able to defend them when they're teased. So um, arm your kids with answers or the ability to answer in their language and help inform others. We also know we all seek out education, counseling, and support. That's one of the first things we do when our children get a diagnosis like this. But I do remember the emphasis was me going and getting the support and education and getting my child in for support and counseling. And it took us a while to realize the daughter needed it as well. Um, so taking her in as well. Once you have education, you start working on the awareness and not just of what's going on with that affected child, but also the non-affected sibling. So you wanna think very carefully about how the experiences today in your home might impact how the kids perceive your home later on. Jeremy actually talks quite about, a bit about this from her work. She calls it tone of the home. 
So what do you want your kids to remember about what the tone of the home, the atmosphere in the home was like down the road? And if you think about that and put that as a goal or an image, make adaptions, adaptations, so that that tone is where you'd like, like it to be. So think about tone of the home. Listen to your child's report of issues and let them know their feelings matter. And this one raised another story for me where um, it was pretty easy. My son had also ODD, and so we had a lot of behavioral issues and meltdowns. And it's, it's exhausting to deal with that. And in the grand scheme of things, her little, I, in my mind, again, I hopefully I never said this to her, her little complaints about this or that just paled in comparison to what was going on here. Or if it looked like he was going to fail a class, but she was worried about not getting invited to a birthday party. Unfortunately, my brain would go to, this is the bigger problem. And I did learn, I'll explain the situation that helped me do that, to really listen to her and to validate her and listen to the report of issues. Another one that my daughter brought up when I asked her how things went was, you know, you never believed me about some of the manipulation that my brother was doing. And um, when I asked him, he said, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I knew I could get away with that. So listen to the report of issues. Let them know their feelings matter and then work on problem solving. Watch for either parent or self-imposed excessive pressure to take care of that sibling. And notice and build on compassion. Again, it's there, there's that kinship, um, but notice it and build on it. For us, one of the ways that that really um, arose in our family was we, my younger two, so my daughter and her younger brother are only 15 months apart. And when they were like early elementary age, it was just constant. He knew how to push her buttons and she always reacted. And he knew how to push her buttons and she always reacted. And it just got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. I just, nothing I did worked. And so I took her with me to my son's psychology appointment. And they got into it during the appointment, almost to the point of fisticuffs. It didn't quite go there, but almost. And the psychologist addressed what was going on with that behavior. And then he excused my son from the room. And he sat my daughter down and he said, that must have been so hard and you must have been so frustrated to do this, this, and this. So he validated her feelings and experience and said, tell me what that feels like. And she did that. But then following that, he said to her, you know, you're right. It is really hard, but you have two ways that you can look at this. You can be resentful, reactive, angry, or you can learn to have empathy and compassion. And he said, what I mean by that is ask yourself, would you trade places with him? And I was shocked at how well that worked. She took a step back. And later on, she said it didn't keep her from getting angry, but she would look at it more from, he is having trouble with his impulses right now. I'm going to walk away. He's not able to stay focused. That's why the channel keeps switching. So she was able to see him and reframe his behaviors in terms of the neurodiversity. I thought that was genius on the part of that psychologist. So now we'll move into communication. And I really am excited about this slide because this came from the Tourette syndrome um, literature. It was actually a study by Malecki and Tarani, 2006. And I'm pointing out the date because he uses healthy siblings versus unhealthy siblings. And we know that's not really the greatest language. It should be neurodiverse or neurotypical or affected and unaffected, right? I'm just gonna read it so I don't get myself confused, but understand, I know that that's probably not how we wanna um, address the issue. But what they found out was communication regarding Tourette syndrome between the healthy sibling and their parents played a really important role with respect to family and sibling relationships, family and sibling relationships. And what they found out, the outcome was that when communication occurred between the healthy siblings and their parents about the Tourette syndrome, it predicted more warmth by the healthy sibling towards their sibling with Tourette's. It predicted more family cohesion as reported by the healthy sibling and adaptability as reported by the healthy sibling. That's fantastic. That's where we wanna go. That's what we wanna do, right? And it was based on communication. So when we talk about communication, we are talking about all the things I just said, you know, giving them information on Tourette's in words that they understand, um, letting them express their feelings, talking to them about your feelings and frustrations and your problem solving tactics. So having that connection in that communication, 
Now, parents will often say, well, I've got an angry sibling or of my child and they are a teenager and they're not going to want to talk to me. It doesn't always mean face-to-face -face or in person, although if you can do that, that's great. But it doesn't have to be in person. Think of the other ways that our kids communicate. Send them a text message. Hey, I saw that you were really frustrated this morning. Let's talk about it when you get home from school. Or, hey, thank you so much for bringing home your brother's homework today. That really was helpful. Um, those kinds of things mean a lot. And I actually got a lot of response from my daughter when I started texting. It also kind of took away that she felt emotional. She didn't have to be emotional in front of me. So um, texting is a nice option if your kids like it. Also, uh, Jeremy talks about post-it notes. And she said, I would stick like a post-it note in their book or on their homework or in their um, athletic bag if they were going to an athletic thing after school. And it would just be something like, oh, you're such a hard worker. Um, I really admire your persistence, you know, so she would, she would put lots of positive messages in there, or I'm here if you need to talk to me after your long day with this test. So that was good. I actually have some parents that came to our chat group that actually do use Snapchat and Instagram to communicate with their kids and got a better response from that. Sometimes, and I'm sure we can all think of circumstances where this happens, it might have to be someone other than you if you need to communicate a certain message or you want to get something across. And that's okay. Recruit that very favorite coach, that uncle, that cousin. Um, get somebody other than you. I had a couple extended family members who were really good when my son was aroused and I just couldn't get through him. I'm like, Chris, that's not the sibling, that's the son. But they would come and talk to him. But I also had, my daughter had a very, very close relationship with one cousin and her grandfather. And she was able, sometimes I would tell the grandfather, this has been happening, can you talk to her a little bit about it? And they would have that conversation. So be comfortable recruiting somebody other than you. Modeling, really important. Just like that psychologist modeled to me how to validate my daughter's feelings, we need to model to our kids how to and practice emotional regulation ourselves. And that's actually when I started learning my emotional regulation. Also that it's okay to fail. We aren't always gonna get everything right. And so you can tell that child, sibling's gonna feel bad if they've been trying really hard, making an effort to get along better, and then they lose it one day. It's like, I noticed you lost it today, but you know, we'll start again tomorrow. It's okay to fail. We can't be perfect all the time and things don't work all the time. You wanna model apologizing and forgiveness, how to respond to others that we just talked about, how to explain what's happening. So we're really teaching and showing our kids what informed advocacy looks like. And now the, the big one, the big one that uh, all of the kids talked about was fairness. Jeremy and I talked about, we could talk about rules and discipline and how to parent. Most of the programming that we look at is how to parent that child with neurodiversity, not so much including the sibling, although those strategies and tactics do work and help the sibling. But the real issue for our kids is this concept of fairness, that disproportionate amount of attention, or they have a different kind of discipline or different expectations. So it's really critical that we help our kids to understand that fair is not equal. It's not that it's the, what it is, is people get what they need, not people get everything the same. And you might think, well, they really don't get that, but they do. And the literature, both in Tourette's and ADHD show that it has a huge impact on cohesion if a child can capture that. So again, I said, you know, you do have to have the right discipline in place um, with the principles of expectations clearly communicated, consistency and following through, validation of kids. But this is great. We're going to circle back to communication. So how do we teach it? Once again, the literature showed that that communication we talked about had a significant moderating effect on both how a sibling perceived how severe the Tourette's was in healthy siblings and the fairness evaluation of the maternal differential treatment. So following education and communication, they tracked and monitored these families. When the sibling was treated differentially, after they'd had that communication, the healthy siblings perceived the treatment to be fair. Wow, big bang for its buck when we use communication as one of our strategies and tools. Time, this one actually it still gives me anxiety to this day. I always felt like I never had enough time. There's only so many minutes in a day, only so many days in a week. But it's not as awful as it might seem. You do need to divide your time. 
So carve out some one-on-one -on -one time and spend it with each child as you are. It doesn't mean it has to happen every day. If it can, great. But find ways to do that. And strategies that were addressed by Jeremy and I and people that have attended our support groups were things like when I took my son to hockey, then I took my daughter out for coffee. Um, when her favorite movie came into town, I got a sitter and took her to the favorite movie. Um, one of the things that I did was that every night, and I, I did try to make it daily for her, is to carve out time by sitting on her bed when she was getting ready for bed and just asking her about her day, seeing if she had anything she wanted to talk about and just sharing one thing I noticed that day that I was, that I really was proud of or loved, you know, loved that she had done. So carving out that time. When I asked her, she said, that was really important because all I really wanted was more time, more time with my parents. So that is one way to do it. Another thing is really including the family, again, building cohesion. So plan and establish regular family activities that everyone enjoys. Jeremy's example, we had an annual Easter egg hunt with all of the family and it gets hilarious with the things that they hide and what they get. In my case, um, my husband actually came up with this idea. Our children are very different personality and interest wise. So when we planned our family vacations, we did three things. We always went to the zoo for my child who loved animals. We always went to a museum for my child that loved history. And we always went to an amusement park for the child that was a thrill seeker. We always tried when we could, anywhere time we went on vacation to hit those three things. Kids loved it. And I think one of my favorite stories is this youngest son, um, when his first big adult trip that he took on his own was a bachelor party out to Las Vegas and his buddies came back and said, he made us go to museums. <laughs> so, you know, that trait, that habit sticks with you um, as they go through life. So plan and establish regular family activities that everyone enjoys. And then just like us, taking some time for ourselves. They need to take time apart. So give them a break. Can they go to grandma's overnight? Um, my daughter had a friend who was an only child. She went with that friend on many family vacations with her. So find ways to get them to take time apart and give them a break. Building a support network. Um, one of the biggest factors on parental stress was social isolation. And we know that this condition, especially when there's significant behavioral outcomes, can make you very isolated. It's hard to be around people that don't understand. It's hard to feel judged. Um, you have to stay home more. And so um, we know that if you have a support network with you, it really builds and buffers um, positive parenting experience with your child. So reach out to peers, good friends that you know will be understanding, to extended family, and again, build a support network of providers who understand you and your child. You might be surprised I'm gonna end the tasks, the skills with talking about you. It's critically important that you think about you. When I started looking into research and, and information for my child, I initially started looking for the magic bullet. Maybe we all do that. What's the one thing I can do right that will make everything work for him? And we know that doesn't exist. But as I previewed the, the literature, the one prognostic indicator, and there really only was this one, was that the emotional health of the primary caregiver was the one thing that consistently affected the outcome um, for the child with ADHD, despite and regardless of the type of um, interventions they were doing. So knowing that it's not only okay, but it's essential to take care of you. We all know the story on the airplane where you gotta put your oxygen mask on before the kids. Same principle here. You've got to make sure that you are healthy, you are well, so that you have what you need to give to your child. Take care of your physical needs. It's alarming how many of us with neurodiverse children um, don't do our doctor appointments, don't go to the gym, don't exercise. So take care of your physical needs. Um, this, is, it, this is a good point. Be sure that you are assessed for and treating and managing your own behavioral health diagnoses or challenges. Remember, both these traits are highly heritable. So be sure that if you suspect you have the problem, go in and get assessed, go in and get your treatment. Give yourself permission like we do with our kids to take a break from your child and learn everything you can about ADHD and Tourette's. So I'm gonna close, wrap up. And um, Jeremy and I have a kind of quirky thing where we do, this is the final word. Oh no, we have ADHD. There's a final, final word. You got two slides for the final word. So final word, what can we do? The takeaway from the last slide, I want to really emphasize again, parents, and I should add in here, get assessed and get treated if you have 
a condition. Get it now, get treated, get treated now. Think about ADHD, anxiety, depression, self-care, feed your soul, feed your soul so you have something to give. Don't forget daily forgiveness. There needs to be a clean slate every day. And that was one thing that, that really turned our family function around was when all of us agreed, no matter what happened the day before, the next day was a clean slate. And we'd all start off with a clean slate for each other. And that day might not go well either, but then the next day was the clean slate. And it just gives you this feeling of, okay, I got another chance. Um, so these are the things we talked about in skills. So I hope you found things to take away with awareness and education, communication. Wow, wasn't that a huge impact on, on the outcome? Modeling, explaining fair, time, and building your support team. The final word, what can you do? But the final, final word, really the whole point of this kind of talk and what we really all want for our children is for them to have success, thrive, have cohesion amongst each other and flourish. And that's whether it's our neurodiverse child or it's our, to our child that doesn't have the neurodiversity. And so you ask yourself, what does that look like? And again, I refer back to tone of the home. Did you get there? I wanna point out my kids that had the fisty cuffs in the doctor's office, here they are, right here. So again, that hopeful message, time and maturation and emphasis on communication does make a difference. And this was my daughter on her college graduation day and her brother ran up and the first thing he wanted was a selfie with her. So far cry from fighting in the doctor's office to this. So what does that look like? No one can tell you what it looks like. What we know is it's an ongoing journey and you can feel it in your heart and in your soul and when your family, when it's coming together. And again, you will have good times and ebbs and flows but you've got success and you keep building on that success. So that's it, that's what I got. Um, are there any questions or would you be reading them to me, Wendy, if there are any or comments? Yes, I will definitely read them to you. And um, I am going to read um, a few first and I will also read, there's been some great comments. This was really wonderful. Um, thank you so very much for this actually. And um, before we go on to questions, I just want to ask our attendees, I first wanna thank you, Jane, and thank you for taking the time to answer questions now. This really was terrific. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, while we're answering questions, I did put a link to our survey in our um, chat panel. If our attendees could just go on and answer um, the questions in the survey while they listen to the answers to these questions, it would be very much appreciated as it informs our future programming here at the Tread Association. And um, we love to be able to bring you great program like, like this that um, Dr. Indergar just did for us tonight. Um, so Jane, as Jane said, she's going to take questions and um, any questions, any relevant questions that aren't answered um, right now, there may be more than we can answer or some that would be better off answered after the webinar. Um, we will send those in our follow-up email answered either by Dr. Indergard or another clinician that can respond to those questions. So with that, um, let's see, I did have somebody reach out to me that with a couple good questions first um, before the webinar. And um, they asked, one of the questions is, um, and you may have answered this, but I wonder if you could maybe elaborate for the person that asked this question. How do you get a neuro, how do you get neurotypical siblings to fully understand what's going on inside their neurodiverse sibling and why they can't help it? So I think this person, um, when they wrote in, they were really asking about how to help the sibling understand why the child um, with ADHD and Tourette can't help what they do. It's really important to emphasize, you, you really just share the information, but of course at a level and a language they can understand. And actually um, I'm sitting in my home office and I'm seeing my books over here. There are some books for age kids. I'm gonna just excuse me a minute, I'm going to grab one. Hopefully you can find more like this. But for example, all dogs have ADHD. And that's so it described like impulsivity and hyperactivity and so on. So it, it puts it in a, in a format that that child can understand. It is okay. You don't have to get real clinical about it, but it is okay to explain, you know, that there's 
messengers in the brain. And if they're working a certain way, the, um, this behavior will happen. But if they're struggling with it, if there's chemical imbalances, you can you can use those kinds of explanations. So um, I just I, upright and for, you know, forthright and upfront. Um, our kids, we never kept it a secret. Sometimes they said it went over our head, but then they would come back and ask questions later. So um, as much as you can explain that it is a neurodevelopmental condition, don't use that word, but it is an actual brain-based condition. It's their brain works differently. And as a result of those differences, these kinds of behaviors come out. I think it's also important when you're talking about the deficits or the challenges that you also talk about the things that you can do or they can do that we're gonna to try to do to help them hold it together better, help them succeed, help them manage their symptoms. Thank you for that. Great answers. Um, here is another question. Uh, this person said, um, this is also validating, which was many, which were many comments in here of how validated people felt this evening um, with this presentation. Can you please comment on the families with two neurodiverse children? We have one with Tourette anxiety and ADHD and the other with ADHD, which isn't well managed yet. Thank you for that question because really, realistically, most of us probably will not have just one child with neurodiversity. And as I mentioned, my daughter ended up getting a diagnosis of ADHD later on. And girls typically get, can not typically, but can get diagnosed later. So I do have all three children with neurodiversity in my household and ah, it's, it's exhausting. Jeremy has five children and all five of them have some form of neurodiversity as well. She has multiple uh, neurodiversities in her family. And so we've talked about this a lot. Um, you have to have a sense of humor. You have to take care of yourself. You have to help them understand each other. So if the question is really asking like, how do you get one neurodiverse child to understand the neurodiversity of the other child? It's the same thing that you did, like I said, with my daughter, I explained it to her and she said, actually, when she got her diagnosis, then she understood so what was happening with her. It's very interesting when you start explaining that um, to the siblings. My oldest son actually came to me and said, I need to go in, I think I have ADHD. And, and to be honest with you, even though we were you know, talking about it and reaching out and educating, I just thought he was lazy. He was a teenager at the time. How classic, right? But I said, oh, you just want a diagnosis because your brother has one. And, and he said, no, please, mom, just get me tested. And if it's not, I'll never bring it up again. And I brought him in and he did. His brother had hyperactive, convulsive, you know, compulsive and um, hyperactive, I'm sorry, impulsive um, and inattentive combined type. This son only had inattentive, but he had it. And it was very significant. So he figured it out after hearing the things I was talking and teaching about his other brother. So it can help, also help him have some self-awareness of how their brain is working. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of the comments before I answer the questions. Um, thank you so much for doing this. This is so appreciated. I appreciate the acknowledgement of how hard daily life can be. The simplest things wreak havoc on our family at night and it's hard to explain to those who don't live with it. Thank you. Um, Let's see, I think um, there was a question up here that I thought you could address. Um, so there's a question about um, a child with TS and ADHD and anxiety. And this child does not have any siblings and they have a desire, a desire to have a sibling. And they were wondering your input um, if having a sibling would help with boredom and less depression? Well, as we know, the sibling relationship can be very um, um, intensive, but also very um, productive for the siblings. They learn a lot from each other, right? But um, I love that question, actually. Are you asking me if I should tell you to have another child? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a very personal decision and a, and a household decision. I would certainly encourage anything you could do to increase socialization if you, if you if that's by um, expanding your family, but or if it's by bringing more people in, cousins, best friends that have children that age, certainly relationship and socialization between kids is a very important dynamic growing up. Um, I hope I answered that correctly. I, I, I love the question because I think that's just so sweet that that parent is thinking about what would help my child the best. But really, it's it's not whether or not you have another child. 
It's just that that child has exposure to socialization of peers or other children their age. So, thank you. Um, and I think let's see if we have another question. I just want attendees to know that I put a lot of resources in the chat, and I will be sending those resources and a follow up email. Um, Dr. Indergard has um, shared her slides, so there's a PDF in the chat, and I can share those in a follow-up email. Um, let's see. That's with that one. I think we have answered all the questions. Um, oh, here we go. So they're wondering how to deal with jealousy from the child with, they said with disabilities, I'm assuming with Tourette and ADHD, because that's what we're talking about, toward the neurotypical child. So I think it's kind of a reverse um, jealousy or maybe not a reverse, but a jealousy from, you know, a little bit reverse of what we've been talking about a jealousy from the child with Tourette and ADHD toward the neurotypical sibling. Exactly, that's a, an excellent observation and a point to bring up. And yes, we experienced quite a bit of that. I got a lot of, you love her better than me. You know, she gets to do the X, Y, Z and I don't. Um, I think really it goes back to two-way communication. Communication goes both ways. Explaining to that child, fair is not equal. You are getting what you need. She is getting what she needs. Um, I think it, in some cases, it might be a little bit more difficult for them to pick that up, um, but you just keep reassuring that. And I also think when kids feel validated and um, feel like they have your time and attention, but, you know, trying to have spend time one on one with them, that does decrease um, that dynamic. But, you know, we have jealousy even in families with no neurodiversity, right? It's, it's just part of growing up and dealing with it. Um, but I think just the reverse of what we were doing, um, going the other way and helping. We have to be held to that same standard of understanding fairness. Thank you so much. I so appreciate this again. And I know our attendees have really appreciated all of this information. Um, it's been, I've learned and I just feel so good bringing this to our community. Um, so helpful. Uh, I, I wish that I had this webinar even when my children were younger, but so fabulous to have now. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending tonight. Um, you can reach out to us at support at Tourette.org if you need um, any other information on Tourette syndrome or any other kind of support, any questions. And Jane and Jeremy were gracious enough to put their uh, email addresses here on the screen for you. Um, I very much appreciate that, and I'm sure the attendees do as well. Um, from all the comments that we've had, um, everybody that was on tonight, um, I, I think everybody is appreciative and um, thank you so much for, for this again, um, Jane. For having us and you know, thank all, all of you who are attending, thank you for being here. You know, you're the reason our kids are doing well, you know, and, and thriving. So thank you very much. This was just a delight. So thank, thank you. you. And everybody have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye.